Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today we have a very requested guest on the show. This is Sarah Carter. She is a BBC trained mixing and mastering engineer based in Hampshire, UK. Sarah started recording and mixing music in the mid 90s as a hobby from a small home studio after playing guitar for many years. Then in 2000, in a bold move, she decided to sell her house, give up her established career of 16 years, and relocate to London to turn that hobby into her new full-time career. Now, above all, she's relished working in the BBC's Maida Vale Studios, where she developed her mixing and critical listening skills, working on sessions with a wide variety of artists from Crowded House to The Cure and Adele to The Black Keys, to name just a few. Likewise, she's been officially credited on records from Corrine Bailey Ray, K.T. Tunstall, and Girls Aloud, amongst others. All right, without further ado, let's hop into our interview with Sarah Carter. Sarah, it is so good to have you on the show today. I've got a ton of questions from you. There are a ton of individuals within my community that have been shouting it from the rooftops, get Sarah Carter on the show. Um, and it's just, it's amazing the the feedback from the community, not just my community, but you know, over at Produce Like a Pro Academy and all of the the wonderful people over there. Um, we're so glad that you came on board and I'm so glad that Warren has this innate ability to like just know who to pick. <laughs> and it's just awesome to see him like reach out and take someone in under his wing. And then, I mean, obviously you already know what you're doing, but it's so cool that you can sort of lock arms with people that, you know, have the same sort of core principles and mindsets about audio. And they're not just out there like trying to sell people you know, a bag of goods that just to make money. And yeah. whenever I've viewed your channel and believe me, I've been stalking you for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I viewed your channel, I was like, this lady, not only does she know her stuff, but she is like literally trying to help people. And that resonates with me because I think, you know, that's, you, you got your heart in the right place. And that's what, what I love about your channel as well. And so I wanted to bring you on, um, not just to, um, get to pick your brain and talk music and shop, but I wanted to get to know you uh, more personally as well as I think my audience would love to know more about you. So first question right out of the gate, kind of a big one, but um, yeah. where did your love of music come from? Oh, gosh, that, that <laughs> yeah, that was really, I think, down to two things. The first of which is that my mum... Um, she used to be a singer. Um, she's no longer with us, but back in the sort of 60s, kind of before I was born, yeah, um, she used to sing in a like a jazz trio in um, the north of England, which at the time was kind of the place to be for music. Um, and she uh, developed, a, you know, quite a following and was regularly booked uh, for, to, to perform. And because of that, there was always music in the house. There was always her equipment. Um, she used to have a couple of like Vox uh, combo amps um, and a mic, you know, a microphone and a stand. And they were always around. And I was just fascinated by the microphone because you know, I'd seen people on the television using one and I was right. thinking, oh, you know, oh, we've got one of those. And I, I just remember being fascinated by it, the weight of it, the smell of it as well. You know, um, yeah, it was it, it, it just fascinated me. But then the other thing is that I grew up in a pub um, and my, you know, all I could hear at night going to sleep was the jukebox downstairs and it was just the sound of it was just permeate through the floorboards and I think it just must have you know <laughs> sunk into my brain cells somehow right. during sleep but that was through the 70s so I you know as a consequence I love um, disco <laughs> um, glam rock nice. and then Mum, with mum's background, uh, we had all the kind of 60s crooners on there as well. So, you know, I've got a real wide range of, of music that I love to listen to. And that takes me right back to that time. But I think that really is where my love of music came from. Just it being all around the house. 
and wow. the jukebox, the jukebox downstairs. My my mum used to um, when the pub was closed. I didn't. Yeah, we didn't have like a uh, any sort of system to play music on in the living room areas of the pub. So uh, she just used to uh, um, click up lots of credits on the jukebox. She'd just lift the lid of the jukebox and just click away. And <laughs> I was left in the pub uh, in the semi-darkness listening to music on the jukebox, full, you know, full blast out into the pub. And I used to pull up a bar stool and pretend, you know, to be singing singing along to all the tunes and yeah that must be where it came from yeah wow it's <laughs> it's crazy how that a lot of mix engineers and mastering engineers that i've talked to producers in general um it's almost like music finds them before they yes. even know that they're into music yes. and like it almost like arrests their lives and and you know in such a way to where like it just kind of creeps up on them and then one day like it just like clicks um so along those same lines like when did your love of music and all of this that's permeating your life now when did that turn into like okay now i want to tinker with this stuff i want to like mm. start messing with these microphones and start mixing audio together like when did that transition take place for you to say i want to be an audio engineer yeah I think that started early as well, although I didn't really take action on it until quite a bit later on. But that, I mentioned um, my mum being a singer. My dad was actually her um, sort of sound engineer. He By day, he was an elect electro electrical engineer. Um, but he also used to look after and maintain all my mum's equipment, all the audio equipment. and drive her to gigs and drive her back again and then go to his job in the morning. Um, but he used to, uh, it, I just remember we used to have this suitcase, really old vinyl suitcase at home that he used to have all this cabling in, broken audio plugs, different, uh, tinier, smaller microphones and you know that had a smell to it as well when you open it up i don't know if you've ever been around old electronics but it it mm. has a, a smell about it it's very distinct yes yeah and so I, that that suitcase used to fascinate me all the little bits and pieces and screws and um plugs and and whatnot and he used to give me a plug a mains plug, it sounds really dangerous and I can't imagine anybody doing it now, but it wasn't dangerous. He used to give me a plug. The plugs in uh, the UK are three pin plugs. And you you can't you can't do it now because of safety reasons, but back then you could just unscrew them to change the fuse, uh, to obviously wire the plug to be able to use it in the wall. And um, he used, just used to give me a plug and a screwdriver and I would sit uh, on the bar in the pub and just uh, for hours would just take this plug apart, all the little tiny screws and clips and bits and pieces and then put it all back together again. And um, that I think is what I'd, I'd always been kind of uh, since then anyway, been led to uh, technical objects and, and gadgets and gear and wanting to use them, but also know how they worked. And I think that was that kind of the catalyst for it. But nothing really came of that. I, you know, went to school and did all the usual things. I didn't go to college or university. I, I left school at 16 and went straight into work. And uh, it was nothing to do with the audio industry. Um, and, you know, you get kind of get stuck in a loop. And I did that for, uh, it was about 16 years I did that. So. We're talking, yeah, I was I was in my early 30s um, when I actually decided to uh, go to change my career and go to uh, audio school and get some sort of training. Because, you know, from sort of like the mid 90s, uh, I'd been recording myself at home on a four track. And then that I think it's such the I hear this story from other engineers and people must think it's you know it's made up but it's so true I had like a porter studio and started to record myself playing guitar at home and trying to get better 
uh, and then slowly that kind of I went moved away from the guitar because I'm I'm not a musician but I had developed this interest in recording um, so much so that you know by the very late 90s uh, early 2000s I decided that uh, you know I wanted to go and do something about it get out of my previous career and get into audio somehow um, so yeah I was kind of in my early 30s by the time I actually transitioned into being um, an audio engineer as such you know actually getting paid to do it <laughs> <laughs> so at, at what point then did you transition into working with the BBC and what are some some key takeaways from the years that you have invested there yeah um, I think the BBC I tried before get, I actually got the job at the BBC I tried to get um, uh, positions in traditional studios but I think that I was a probably a bit too old for them at that, at that time they were wanting young people out of university with uh, degrees I didn't have a degree I just had a, an audio diploma from um, SAE so it was a decent diploma um, but it just wasn't it just wasn't happening it wasn't falling into place for me because as well they were the the sort of uh, the money the salary was so low um, if at all and I was in my 30s and I had a house and a mortgage you know I got responsibilities so it just wasn't it just wasn't lining up it didn't it wasn't working I wasn't being offered the positions and uh, had I been offered I wouldn't have been able to take them anyway and then the the, um, the job at the BBC came up came into my attention you know I think um, perhaps I'd registered on the web website for jobs uh, and interest um, and yeah lo and behold it uh, it just kind of dropped into my inbox and I thought well I'll you know this is really good because they're it's the BBC which is fantastic um, I'm gonna get some great training and it's not that far away from where I live it's completely doable um, and they're gonna pay decent money you know so I thought well I'll go for it and I went all out to learn how to actually apply for a job um, you know what in the best way that would really make me stand out as a candidate and I spent a long time on the um, application and that uh, thankfully after several interviews and practical uh, tests I got in um, and had a wonderful time a wonderful six and a half seven years working at Maida Vale in the studios there meeting all sorts of wonderful people working with all sorts of wonderful people as well really talented engineers and um, working on the road as well I used to do festivals and do live sound in the um, in a truck at the back of the um, venue next to the bins <laughs> and um, yeah that it was a really wonderful time and I learned so much my listening skills developed incredibly you know I went into the BBC not knowing what a good anything is supposed to sound like I suppose I'd had a taste of it at college but you know it, it, that was such a small part of my life at that point just that you know that 18 months at college um, I didn't really know what a good capture sounded like so that skill was um, was really brought out for me that and learning how to manage time and um, make decisions quickly and stand by them because we you know it's a radio studio so we, everything is governed by time either you're going live on air and coming off air at set times so you have to you have to be ready and you have to be finished or it's a booking situation where the studio is booked from you know 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon and you've got to record and mix three songs so it was you've got these time constraints that really focused your mind on making sure the session moved quickly and you got a good enough 
recording and mix at the end of it. And good enough being key, really, that phrase. Um, and it, one of my things at the moment uh, with the Simply Mixing channel is uh, I'm, I'm aware that people just get lost in the mixes and just keep working on the same songs or the same part of the song over and over and over for hours or days trying to get it perfect and perfection is it you know it kills creativity in in my mind and it there's no need for it just get it good enough because the the more you release music you make the decision you do what you want to do to the sound it sounds good enough yeah you know it sounds good and then you move on release that song or forget about that mix go on to the next then you're going to get quick the quicker you're going to get better at mixing not faffing about messing about with the snare drum for three days because you've just gone blind then you know you're blind to it <laughs> so for me everything is about making quick decisions um, in order to keep the creativity flowing and just to keep moving and releasing songs or you know if you don't release songs if you're not a band or an artist and you're just doing it for pleasure just doing it for your own fun just call it a day it's done and then the great thing then is you can go back years you know if you you know pull out a mix you did three years ago listen to it and compare it to what you're doing now you know and it's like wow yeah i am getting better so yeah the the bbc helped me in so many ways to get the, basically listening skills and work into time constraints i think is the the, the best um skill i came out of the bbc with really Man, everything you just said right there was like golden. I have been shouting this stuff from the rooftops on my channel for so long now. It's It feels really good to bring on other professionals like yourself and to hear them say this. The key takeaway here that she's talking about is the same thing that I keep saying, guys. It's like, if you just get with that, I love how she just said, make sure that it's good enough. Like, where's your skill set at now based off of where it was? Like she's even said three years ago look at that say okay i've made some improvements but i'm as good as i can possibly get right now i'm just going to release it let's get some feedback on it and then we can move from there what you're going to find out is that the more you do a thing the better you get at it so the next time you go back to release that next song it's going to sound exponentially better than the one you've released before that so that leads me to my next question then because i know that you've had a lot of ups and downs you've had a lot of these opportunities for experience like I just spoke of. So can you describe a breakthrough that you had that you feel like, wow, this has taken my skill set to the next level? If we include mindset in uh, the definition of skill set, it would it would be really it, this was a real there were two turning points, actually, but I'll, I'll hi highlight this one first. I went to mix with the masters i went on one of their seminars with sylvia massey mm -hmm. and yeah and she me going there initially i'd been running my uh, freelance mixing and mastering business uh, for a couple of years before going um so i you know i'd had feedback clients were happy but I still had a bit of self-doubt. Um, I came into it with a lot of self-doubt. I came, Well, I came out of the BBC with a lot of self-doubt, um, which I've spoken about on other interviews. Um, but going into my own business as a freelance engineer, I felt better in myself and felt more confident in myself. But I still, you know, wasn't quite sure. So I went to mix with the masters and we had a brilliant week uh, recording a band and mixing the band. Um, and part of the week is that you go and you take your own um, mixers and Sylvia would sit, we'd, we'd have a day where we'd just listen to each other's mixers 
and get you'd get some feedback. Um, and that was the turning point when uh, I sat down to play my mix to Sylvia Massey uh, in a wonderful studio. No pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure, barefoot monitors, you know, and I hadn't heard, I didn't know what my mix sounded like in on those monitors in that room. It sounded great at home, <laughs> but I didn't know what it translated like into a studio. And uh, we pressed play and it played through and I, th and I thought, oh, this sounds okay. This is all, thank God, thank God it's okay. <laughs> you know, I'm not making a fool of myself. This sounds okay. And then, um, you know, the mix played all the way through and at the end, she just was so, you know, hands in the air, sort of, yeah, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, and the guys, the other guys in the group as well, uh, in the um, on the seminar, everybody was really complimentary about it. And Sylvia just sort of said that she thought it sounded great. She made a few tiny observations about levels, I think, in a chorus, but she just said that I had good ears. And I thought, yes, <laughs> it was the validation I needed. So that was a turning point in my mindset that, yes, I am good enough, <laughs> you know, using that phrase again, because a lot of people out there do use that phrase and they, they question themselves. Am I good enough? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are, because you're doing it, you know. So, of course, you're good enough. Um, but I've been there and, you know, that particular point in my life was a was a big turning point. Um, and gave me the confidence to carry on, go forward, keep going with the business and then launch a YouTube channel um, to help other people. Because, I, you know, I obviously have seen some sort of success with the business and, and with clients. Uh, and I just thought I'd be able to pass that on to, to other people who are struggling with things I've struggled with, you know, in the past, the, the whole, am I good enough? Um, also, the the big thing is that people struggle with being able to hear what sounds right, and what's wrong, how to make these decisions. So I want to help people do that because that's the crux of it. I think once um, you've got the courage uh, and conviction to stand by your decision in your mix and every every tiny decision that you make in the mix, then it you will feel so much better about what you're doing and the end result. So, and that's what I want to try and get across to people on the channel. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to make your videos and to start the channel. As we were sort of speaking beforehand off camera, I, I love your work and I love the fact that you are, you can tell when someone is doing it for the right reasons and you're definitely got your heart in the right place. Not only does it shine through on the camera, but in your teaching, in your training. And I love the fact too that it seems like to me at least, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems as if you're trying to not just appeal to people with million dollar studios, but you're like, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, whatever stage in your mixing career or even your hobby, let me help you. That is, yes. that's awesome. Kudos yes. to you for that. That is, that is huge. And the world needs more of that these days. I have told my audience on numerous occasions and I try not to say it so often that it sounds like I'm trying to hard sell um, yeah. myself because I always tell people like you need a mentor but I'm like I hope they don't think that I'm telling them like you need yeah. me <laughs> yeah but like whoever it is like it doesn't have to be me but you need to yeah. find a mentor because little moments like you just spoke of right there that change you know from that moment of imposter syndrome where yes. you're dealing with all of these self-doubts and can I and can I not those can all be turned in an instant whenever you finally get that feedback that you're looking for. For me personally, it was when Warren reached out to me and said, hey, I seen you work in Cakewalk. We don't have a Cakewalk course. That was the validation that I needed. Like, okay, all this hard work that I've been doing, trying to help people is actually getting noticed and not just noticed by just anybody. It's being noticed by a multi-platinum producer. Yeah. I'm like, okay, there's something to this. Like, I'm so glad that I kept with it. And we're so glad as a community that you're sticking with it. For those of you that are watching this or you're listening on the podcast, you have to know this. The, the logistics 
of creating content to help people is really a labor of love because the you know return on in investment that you get from YouTube is next to nothing. So whenever you see individuals like Sarah, like myself, like Warren, putting these videos out there, YouTube is not paying like millions of dollars to people like this, especially in this sort of niche audience. Mm. So literally just coming from my standpoint, I want to sincerely thank you because I know the hours that are invested in recording, messing up a line 50 times and having to go back and re-record and all the editing and guys, she's doing this by herself just like I am. So I'm, I feel for her. I'm like, sister, hang in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thank you so much for doing everything that you do. So. Oh, thank you. That's all very kind words. Thank you so much. Um, I wouldn't do it if I didn't love doing it. So, right. you know, um, and, and I think what keeps me going actually is the comments uh, that I get on the, uh, at the bottom of every video. I've yeah. got had so such a warm reception and uh, comments uh, of thanks from people and just makes me want to keep it keep doing it really keep doing all the more and it seems that um, I've got a particular way of delivery that people are resonating with so uh, that's nice as well so I don't have to pretend to be somebody I'm not right right um, so you know we're you know Warren is Warren and he's up and on his videos his energy is very high and um, I th my, our energy might be a bit lower than that <laughs> but um, you know it all attracts different people and uh, the more people we attract the more people we can help uh, release more wonderful music out into the world so exactly and you know yeah. I've been saying that here recently too and in light of all the events that have taken place in the world, I really feel like the world needs good music right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually, I literally just did a uh, analysis of Bob Marley's No Woman, No Cry. And I was thinking in the back of my mind, as I'm crying, listening to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and uh, Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? That was another good one that I just did that literally was crying too. I'm like, people are going to think he's crying on every video. What's going on? But... <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, it's like I, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, like we need artists and musicians to rise up right now more mm. so than ever and give people some good music to get their minds off of all the chaos and yeah. to give them hope because good music can really inspire people. Yes, and it always has throughout history. So, you know, um, I feel very blessed to be able to work in it uh, at the, the, the level I'm at and uh you know, be able to pass on knowledge so that other people can do it too. And it all spider webs out and yeah, it's all, it's all very worthy um, and fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, whenever you sit down to, to work on a mix, like I know there's like a hundred different elements at times that we're thinking about as mix engineers, as producers, but what do you feel like and this could be kind of tricky because every mix is different, but what do you feel like just on a broad spectrum is the most important element of a good mix? For, right. I could just go, you know, there are obvious things like, you know, getting the low end right and getting clarity in your mid range. And that, of course, they are super important. And when you're asking which is the, you know, the most important element of a good mix, they are there at the top of the list. But um, I think I want to touch on something a little bit different, and that is that the arrangement really needs to be good. Mm. Now that, uh, I say good, it needs to be interesting and move the listener through, um, you know, emotions, whatever it is you're trying to, uh, get across in your music but as mix engineers that's kind of out of our hands I'm strictly a mix engineer I, I'm not a music producer although I do get called on because um, that's just kind of the nature of the business um, but uh, I, I'm a mix engineer so a producer has done their work to it before I get it 
And that producer could be a producer per se, you know, or it could be the guitarist and the drummer in a band have, have, have put the tracks together themselves. So what I'm given, I'll mix. And I might add one or two little bit of, you know, a few elements maybe to make it a little bit more interesting. So the arrangement is key. But let's say that the arrangement has been dialed in by a producer or the drummer and the guitarist. And when I get it, what I try and do is facilitate that movement through the song for the listener, through the arrangement. And so what I do is I think what one of the most important elements of a good mix is as a mixer, being able to identify which is the focus instrument of vocal in any section of the song. So moving through the song, listening to the uh, to the mix and thinking, OK, which instrument here needs to take the lead? Which and and by changing the focus like that through the uh, the stages of a song, you can really take the listener on a journey, and that's something that I I, I enjoy doing and developing because that's um, an an area that I feel like I'm learning. Um, or, or want to learn more of is identifying which element to push to give that a little bit of excitement and movement. You know, I love mixers that move from side to side, not in a not in a kind of seasicky kind of panning way, but but in a subtle way that you don't really realise it. It's something you feel. Yeah. It's and it contributes to the emotion. Um, and that's how I want to develop as a mixer going forward. Um, is uh, is to identify those those elements that really pull the listener through the song so that they don't want to press stop or skip but they want to listen to your song all the way through so that I think for me is probably one of the most important elements in mixing were, were you looking over my shoulder whenever I was making <laughs> this last video for my VIPs because I'm like uh, you're like right there I was talking about how much <laughs> Like emotion is like the biggest part for me as well. I mean, it's different for every mix engineer. Yeah. But to what you just said, I mean, I love to try and accentuate any emotional sort of feedback. Like, I think one of the biggest things of the songs of yesteryear that are still playing on the radio today was that emotion that was baked into them. Mm. And um, sometimes we can get caught in a trap in a studio because it sometimes can be a very sterile environment you know you're overdubbing guitars now instead of playing along with the rest of the band and you're not singing with your guitar and now you're singing in a vocal booth yes it yes it detaches you from that emotional sort of investment that you have yeah and if, if you as a mix engineer can say okay well how can i still bring that out but also make it interesting in such a way to where people will feel that and there's there's like hundreds of ways to do that but i love how you're you're talking about the emotionally driven aspect because not a lot of people think about that mm, um yeah you, know, you watch a hundred tips tricks and tutorials videos and they tell you how to get your low end in check and it sounds all very technological and analytical but it never really touches much on like okay but how is this making you feel yes yes like maybe that eq boost that you just did Maybe X, Y, and Z channel told you that was stupid. Don't ever do that. There's a great quote that I picked up from Michael Brower. Um, and he, he said something along the lines of when he was talking about a mix and why he'd done a certain something. And he'd said, um, it's not a hear thing. It's a feel thing. Mm -hmm. And it really stuck with me. I thought, wow. Yeah. Okay. So that is kind of a quote that is on my desktop that I see every few days pop up. Nice. But another thing I wanted to highlight of what you've just said, and that is the, the emotion. People will say, well, how? I think what is really important, and this is something that I, I like to teach people, is to move quickly and react is, is to be aware of your body when you're mixing 
be aware of when you can you hear something and it makes you feel a certain way or you think oh that's interesting and do something about it there and then react um if you can't do something about it there and then just make a note write a note down to come back to it but it's so important to keep moving and to use you use your instinct as i will say is use your gut your gut feeling and that is how you identify which where the emotion points are in your mix um not faffing about with the snare drum for three days <laughs> you're gonna lose it right. what you need to do is react soon is be aware be present uh to what you're listening to but not over analyze just let it happen and if something grabs you do something about it either just make a note if you can't do it if you don't want to deal with it right now or deal with it right now and explore your creativity you know um and that's uh that's using your gut that's reacting that's instinctive and and if the very fact that you are mixing music making music producing music whatever you have got gut instinct you know what sounds good because you've been listening to records your whole <laughs> life right you you know you are good enough you do have the skills yes one or two might need tweaking a little bit or tuning but you know yes you've you've got the you've got the tools you've got the wherewithal so just keep going um and pick up tips along the way from the likes of yourself or me or Warren or Michael Brower or whoever and just you know everything's kind of stolen isn't it from I don't think don't, don't they say there's no original right. nothing original these days everything has been borrowed and and used um, uh, from other people and we're, we're the same so if you see somebody doing something that you think oh that's interesting that looks like a good idea try it and if it works put it in your mix template and keep trying it and change it and then you know move with the times keep things interesting um, and keep that flow going the creativity going um, it's so important so you mentioned this um, this quote sort of that you've got on your your desktop from Michael Brower um, so who would you say is your biggest inspiration then at this given time um, I've got some favourites. I'd have to hark back to Sylvia Massey as being the biggest inspiration because of what she's achieved in her career. And being a woman, in when she started out, you know, the whole world, well, the whole, um, you know, music studios were pretty much full of men. There were a handful of women that were making a name for themselves. And she, you know, she just got on with it and... Uh, I had a conversation with her about it and we had a similar uh, experience uh, working through or working in male dominated environments, both of which experiences were very positive and uh, didn't feel any kind of hindrance. So I guess I know there are women out there that have not been so lucky. So um, I, I feel very uh honored that I've been able to pursue this as a career and have felt supported all along the way and Sylvia told the same story which was which was really interesting so yes she is a great mentor and the things she's achieved in her in her life and how she, her work ethic she's just happy she loves music she still loves music she loves the technical side of it you know she uh, she um, comes up with all sorts of electronic gubbins to make sound <laughs> different, make sound sound different. Um, and she gets really excited about it, like a child almost, you know. So I love that she loves it so much. And, um, and it's a reminder to me of why I got into it and you know that yes i do love it you know when it comes to that the sixth the sixth hour when you're in final cut pro trying to edit your video right. for youtube that you want to get out tonight 
you know, you just kind of remind yourself of, of these little moments where uh, it's great to be doing what we do. Um, and so I wouldn't swap it for the world, really. Sarah, when you first started out, what was your biggest struggle or your biggest obstacle and how did you overcome that? Um, I kind of touched on it earlier, I think was my age, wanting to get into the get into the audio engineering business or to be an audio engineer professionally um, at, at such a late, a late stage when I'd got so many commitments, uh, financial commitments. And um, uh, I was also quite a way away from London at that point. I was living in the middle of England, which is nothing in the grand scheme of America, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> When we have to drive two hours, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, we have to take a packed lunch and, you know, where are we going to stop? And we have to, it, it's a big deal. But um, yeah, I I was living in the middle of the, the Midlands in England, so it wasn't so easy to get to London. And London is where everything was, was happening. All the studios, uh, well, the biggest concentration of studios is in London. Or the or the surrounding uh, area, and then uh, the schools, the quality schools were down there as well. So uh, yeah, I had to move. So that was uh, an obstacle to overcome. But I, again, I was very lucky, quite fortunate to um, to be with a partner who's very supportive, and uh, we were able to to make it happen. Um, and that continues through today, really. Uh, you know, my thanks uh, goes out to her because it's, I couldn't have done it without her really. She's been so, so supportive. So thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Sam. Let's give her a yeah. round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> if there was someone who approached you and they said, listen, I'm just starting out. I don't know whether to make heads or tails of this what do I do? How do I get started in this? What would be your first piece of advice that you would give someone that's completely new at this? Um, I would say that uh, if they could get as much hands-on experience as possible working with audio, um, that would be the first thing. And that would be things like working in local radio, which is how Sylvia, Sylvia Massey started out as well. She was, she worked, started in radio, um, uh, like I did, so that was weird. But yeah, check your local radio stations. You've got uh, any sort of uh, archiving, audio archiving service. Um, maybe there's something that could be done there. There's uh, maybe something at the church. I know that's quite a big deal in America, the Christian music aspect of things and church music. Um, that I mean, it doesn't really happen over here. It's not nowhere near as large as it is um, over in America. Uh, so get involved with your, with your local church. So what I'm basically saying is just do work with as much music and audio as you can in a audio, audio engineering capacity. Edit it, um, find a door that you like and get really, really good at it. Um, because you've got to try and stand out from the crowd a little bit because it is you know it's quite a popular um career to try and get into so on top of having some sort of well a lot as much experience as you can possibly get um i would say is to find some way of differentiating yourself and uh I think looking at, into some sort of like psychology of people. Uh, there's a great book which I read. I remember reading it when I was coming into this industry uh, and that's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. Really old book, uh, Dale Carnegie, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just gives you the people skills, ways to instantly uh, be likable by people because that's such a huge thing. Um, if you want to work in a studio environment, 
you've got to be likable and you've got to think ahead and almost be one step ahead actually of your whoever it is you're working with who's leading the session so that you can be magically offer them whatever it is they ask you for just like that you know so yeah build up your people skills learn how people tick what makes them happy and be happy yourself in the studio uh or with you know wherever you happen to be working with audio just be happy around people and smile look like you're enjoying yourself um and you know even read up who the studio assistants are you know if you yeah i know it's more difficult these days than it used to be but trying to find out who recorded uh, and mixed an album or a, or a single find out who the assistants were and then try and reach the assistants on in linkedin or something just message them you know you never know they might reply and just ask them what it takes to be a good audio engineer and i'm sure you get gold from that i really am so that's what i would say these are some curveball questions for you okay oh go on then <laughs> i've got a two-part curveball question <laughs> i ask this for everyone who's on the show and when i send the questions over i never include these because i want these to be completely unscripted okay okay yeah First part of the question is, Sarah, what is your favorite color? What is my favorite color, did you say? Yes. Oh, um, <laughs> orange. Awesome. So what does the color orange smell like? Orange. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a trick question? No, that's... <laughs> You answered it just perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> I love asking creatives an off the wall question like that because they will always come up with a really cool answer. Really quickly. Um, I'm glad I didn't say blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what that smells like. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a huge pleasure. My next question for you though is like, if people are wanting to find you, where's mm. the best place that they can find you? Um, I would say uh, probably on YouTube, uh, look for Simply Mixing. Uh, that's my channel. And then also there's the website, simplymixing.com. Awesome. Then um, I have my uh, freelance business, mixing business, which is musicmixpro.co.uk. So I'm on the web there. And uh, then in terms of social media, I don't do that much, but I do regularly go into Instagram. So you find me on Instagram. I think it's Sarah. I think it's Sarah Mix Master Music, something like that. You'd, you'd find me. Nice. Um, and um, yeah, that's it really. A bit of Facebook. I do have a Facebook group called, um, what is it called? Mixing? No. Mastering, mixing, and making music. I say I always have to remember which way around. Uh, but that's a Facebook group uh, that I really want, really, really want to be more active on. But it's there's a, there's I think I've got about uh, three thousand people in there at the moment. So it's quite right. you know it's it's a really nice place uh, to be. Uh, it's got some really great people in there, really helpful people. Post your mix in there, people will give you some honest feedback. Um, and there's, it's a safe place. There's no, you know, shenanigans goes on in there. I won't, I won't allow it. Yeah, so that's it really. Awesome. Well, all applicable links to everything that she's just talked about, they will be down below in the video description, as well as if you're listening on the podcast, they're going to be in the show notes of the podcast where you go and find out all about her and... For those of you who are listening or who are watching, Warren Hewitt in concert with Sarah has actually done something really cool for our audience. If you go over to the ProMix Academy and you purchase her course, you can use the code HSSPMA77 and get a discount off of her $167 course for $77. So you can get a huge discount 
you'll get 11 hours worth of video tutorials all taught by Sarah. It's done incredibly well on the ProMix Academy. I guarantee that you are going to love it. So if you use my special code, you're going to get a discount just for being a subscriber here on the channel or on the podcast. So once again, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Guys, go and check her out. You will thank yourself later. <laughs> thank you. I've had such fun. It's been great, great chatting to you and getting to know you. So thank you.